Um, awesome, thank you. Um, okay, so, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, various ways of bounding the dissipation associated with moving along a particular trajectory. Um, and just to, to, to remind you about our, our sort of toy problem, which, which we're not going to be dealing with um, per se, but which you can keep in the back of your mind. Um, here's a, a strand of DNA. It, it has some complicated conformation, and, and maybe there's a glass bead attached to it, um, which, which we can apply a force with. And, and with a sophisticated glass bead, you can also apply a torque with it. So now we have two control parameters. Um, and I want to think about a, 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 a system that in equilibrium, um, its distribution is, is going to be given by a Boltzmann distribution, and, and it has Hamiltonian like this. So there's some um, intrinsic Hamiltonian, and then I'm going to be applying some control parameters, um, lambda, which couple to some phi mu's like this. Um, um, and, and just as a reminder, um, yesterday we derived the Jarzinski equality. Um, and, and for the rest of this lecture, um, we're just going to be using these first two terms um, and ignoring all the rest here. Um, and, and as a reminder, this beta times the work minus delta F um, is really the increase in entropy, right, in, in this framework, right? Because this is um, uh, the sum of the change of the entropy internal to the system and the entropy of the baths. Um, uh, very soon I'm going to be switching to beta equals 1, um, just as a warning. Um, and so today the idea is going to be that, so we're going to be thinking about protocols that start from lambda naught and go to lambda f. So, so, so I need to move from some initial conditions to some final conditions, and I'm allowed to take any trajectory, but I need to get there in some time t max. Um, and to give you an outline for the lecture, I'm first going to tell you about this bound, um, that, that as I do this trajectory, um, so as I, as I move my control parameters, um, allowing the microscopic state of the system to, 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 to do whatever it does, um, I'm going to need to spend at least this much entropy, um, or I'm going to need to produce at least this much entropy, where L tilde is going to be the geodesic distance in a, a, a geometric space that we're going to define, or that we're going to derive shortly. Um, um, it's going to be squared here, um, and T max appears on the bottom, and, and you can think about this as quantifying how far you are away from the adiabatic limit or from the quasi-static limit. So if I allow the protocol to, to get infinitely large, uh, or infinitely long, rather, um, I can go slower and slower, um, and eventually I can, I can do this in a dissipationless way, in a way that doesn't produce entropy. Um, and then I'm going to introduce the idea of this delta S tot, this total entropy, um, which includes the energetic cost of controlling this. And if you want to think of a way, way to think about this, right, up till now, we've been talking about the work that this glass bead does on the DNA. Um, but of course, if you actually wanted to run this system in an experimental lab, um, you'd be shining a bright laser on this, which is five milliwatts or something. And, and you know, that's, that's infinite KT, right? This is something like 10 to the, K, 10 to the 20 KT per second. Um, um, and so sort of what you're doing is you're expending energy to make this protocol deterministic, right? Um, so, so when you do that, it is a very good assumption to think about this lambda of t as being deterministic. Um, but um, in real systems, if you want them to move forward rather than backwards, you need to pay an energetic cost for that. And what I'm going to try and claim is that when you include that cost, um, there's another bound that the entropy production needs to be greater than twice the geodesic distance um, in this same space that we've been talking about where the metric is the Fisher information. Um, and so this is, this is this L without the tilde. Um, it's just the standard geodesic distance. Um, and this L tilde um, that, that we're going to derive is the same thing except replacing this G with a G tilde. And this, this G tilde is one of the things we're going to derive. Um, OK, does, does, that, does that sound OK? Um, so this, here it is pictorially. We want to move from lambda naught to lambda f, and the two things we want are the, the, the ideal path um, and also the minimum entropy cost. Okay, so, so let's jump right in. Um, first, we're thinking about deterministic protocols and, and all, this, all these things that I've been telling you about, about the cost of making the protocol, we're going to ignore. 
Um, and we're going to use this, and, and, and we're just going to use this one half beta work squared, um, the, this, this correlation, and we're going to calculate this, and we're going to use this to calculate this delta s. Yeah, so this is an excellent question, um, which I don't know how to explain, but I'm told that it's recently been proved that the rest of these terms are always positive. Always. Um, so what, what, what I would like to argue sort of more uh, hand wavily is that um, if you have a very slow protocol, um, um, the fluctuations are going to get very close to Gaussian, and so we can ignore all of these. And, and then the slower you make it, the better you do. So it makes sense that, that there's some limit in which this is the right way to think about it, and we could ignore those. But it turns out you can show that the rest of these are positive, and I don't actually know how that's done. Um, but, but it is true. OK, um, so the work now not in expectation values. Um, the way I've written it here, um, I think there was a, uh, well, anyway, so this, this is going to be lambda dot mu of t times phi mu of t. And remember that at the moment we have a deterministic protocol. Um, so, so when we take expectation values, we can take this lambda dot out of it. Um, but phi mu is going to be stochastic, right? Phi mu is moving around. The second cumulant here, um, we can write as um, work minus work over bar, where I'm going to use this to denote um, just the average value. Um, Right. Um, and now I'm just going to write all of this out. So dt, dt prime. Uh, lambda dot mu, this is at t, this is at t prime. So now I'm actually subtracting off this w bar here. This is also of t. Okay, and, and um, to explain what these overbars mean, the average value of phi mu in all of these trajectories, but at the time t and t prime respectively. Right, so this is the average value of, of this trajectory. Okay, and now, now there's various assumptions we want to make. Um, so, 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 um, so let me first do one more rewriting of this. So we're going to make a change of coordinates from t prime uh, to, to, so we're going to write t prime equals t plus delta t. Now this equals dt. This goes from 0 to t max. t delta t, this goes from minus t to t max minus t. Lambda mu dot of t. plus delta t, and I'm not going to write all this out. Um, but this is the same thing, but just doing the same change of coordinates here. Um, 
And, and now we're ready to say a few approximations that we're going to make. Um, so the first one is that lambda t is very slow um, compared to the time scale at which this fluctuates. Um, and what that means is um, we're going to be able to replace this lambda nu of t plus delta t with lambda nu of t. This is an upper index. Okay, can anyone justify this? So this, this, um, what this really means is that that over the time course at which this term in, in brackets here is non-zero, right? So this, these correlations presumably decay over time. Um, and the assumption is that over the time scale that these correlations decay, um, lambda dot is not changing, right? So, so this is moving very slowly um, and surely, and, and, and we, can ignore, um, we can ignore that time scale. Yes. Um, the other thing we want to do is replace this integral from minus t to t max with minus infinity to infinity. Here, this is from minus infinity to infinity. And really similar motivation, right? That, um, you know, this is fluctuating very rapidly. It very quickly loses its memory on the time scales over which we're driving it. Um, and so the assumption is that, that we can just ignore the, the edges of this, right? The, the, this, this is a very long trajectory compared to the time scales um, of the fluctuations. Um, and there's one more assumption we want to make, um, which is that we can replace this expectation value here um, with the equilibrium expectation value for the second cumulant. So this we're going to replace with um, phi mu bar. And this phi mu bar means at lambda. Yeah, the idea is that, that um, when I actually do this integral over delta t, it's peaked around um, really delta t's that are very small, right? Because this, this correlation function here um, is going to decay very rapidly in time compared to all the other time scales, scales in the system. Um, and over those time scales, we're going to assume that lambda dot of t is just a constant. Um, it's really an assumption about the protocol. So it's the, or I guess a ratio, right? That it's saying that, um, that however fast or slow the, the fluctuations of the system are, um, I'm, I'm driving it much slower than all of them. So that, you know, of course, this, this lambda dot does change with time, um, but only on time scales over which the system has totally lost its memory. Um, and, okay, is this assumption okay? So this is saying that, that not only that, but we're driving it so slowly that this system is really very close to equilibrium. And as a result, if we look at the fluctuation spectrum, um, the fluctuation spectrum is exactly the same as it would be if it were in equilibrium, right? 
So why is that the time between uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, this should be a delta T. So this is this is yeah. Um, yes, so, so this should be this, this, this could be lambda of t or lambda of t prime, but the assumption is that I've moved so little that that, that we can ignore. That I'm moving so slowly that it's the same lambda for purposes of these fluctuations. So the whole t dependence is just dropped out? The delta t dependence is dropped out, exactly. I mean, the. the So, sorry, this is lambda here, yes. Yeah. So th this is lambda of t, right. yes. Uh, but other than that, there's no, there's no t dependence, just something you evaluate in equilibrium at that value. Exactly. So, is this some linear response? This is, this is very much linear response. So this is, the, so, um, um, so th this, this, this is introduced in, in a paper by Crooks and Sivak, which is, which is online, um, and they call this Markov linear response. So they're saying that, um, you know, when a, a, as you look at this protocol and you're and you're somewhere here, um, um, you've forgotten everything that's happened before. All you know is that you're moving at some speed through um, through the system right there, and and you can calculate the work that's being or, or or the entropy production as if you've been going in that direction forever. Yeah. Well, so I'm assuming that, that however fast it's decaying, I'm moving much slower. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I want to move slower. So, 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 so I agree that the um, that that in equilibrium there, there could be long time correlations, um, and and I want to be moving such that um, if I look at so so. You know, at, at some later times, this this lambda dot is going to be different from this one, um, but I want lambda dot to be changing so slowly that by the time that I need to take that into account, this term has gone to zero. Is that okay? So I mean, I, if you're concerned that I need to worry about that term, then I can always go a little bit slower, right? And I'm I'm really looking for the first correction. Very much. I suspect the next term is order lambda dot cubed, but. Um, and that, would, that term is going to probably still just drop the test period. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So this this is only good up to up to terms of lambda lambda dot squared, um, and I do think that that further terms will also be um, higher order in one over t max. So this is this is the one over t max contribution. Um, okay, so if you're if you're willing to accept that, um, so so these are the assumptions. Um, and if we're willing to accept that, uh, then we can rewrite this equation um, as integral from zero to t max dt. And now I'm going to introduce this g tilde mu nu. So I'm going to rewrite it like this, where now g mu nu tilde of lambda is going to be given by um, the integral. Uh, sorry, I'm going to put a factor of two here. The integral from zero to infinity
um, where these bars mean the same thing as they did before, that they're in, 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 in the ensemble defined by lambda. Um, so this is just a rewriting of that. Um, and this defines a metric. Um, so uh, I've, I've replaced minus infinity to infinity with zero to infinity um, because this is an equilibrium expectation value. So, so all of the correlation functions should be symmetric in time. Yeah, so that is true. Um, um, uh, so you, you, the, the next correction to that will also be order higher in lambda. Yeah. OK, so this is the metric. And, and now the next thing I need to show is that um, if you optimize this path, um, you will get twice the geodesic distance squared divided by t max. Um, so this is a result that may be familiar from differential geometry. Um, it wasn't to me, so, uh, so let's go through it. Um, what is this? Yes. Which is we're not going to possibly handle. Exactly. So this is work fluctuations, and actually let's let's write that down now. So so what we really want is work minus delta f. Um, so. Right. Um, and this we're going to write as one half times that. Um, um, so that two is going to cancel. OK, and now we're going to do classical mechanics on this, uh, like you said. Um, so um, we're going to find the, the optimal path. Um, so by setting this uh, functional derivative equal to 0. Um, um, and this is going to give us um, several terms, right? So the first thing I can do is take a functional derivative of this. Um, better put a row here. So this is going to give us the row g tilde mu nu lambda dot nu. Um, then I'm going to take derivatives of this, and then I'm going to need to integrate by parts. Um, and there's two things I can get when I do that. One is that I can integrate by parts and take a derivative of this. And the other is that I can take a derivative of this. Um, so let's write both of those terms out. I get a minus sign from integrating by parts. To lambda double dot new. Uh, right, zero nu. Um, and then we're going to have a um, and and by rearranging these a little bit. Um, we can see that this is actually just the geodesic equation. So this goes to um, sorry. Okay, I should write this out. 
um, plus. If this all equals zero, and this is just the geodesic equation, um, usually after multiplying this here so that this index gets raised. Um, and, okay, so we've found the optimal path now. Um, I'm, I'm optimizing over lambda of t. La oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yes. Uh -huh. Lambda rho of t. Yeah, so um, that is true, so I, I, this works. I, I, I couldn't see it, but um, yeah. So, so it is true that when you, when you extremize this, you get the same thing as if you extremize it with the square root, um, and I th that, that, that's what you're saying. Um, yeah. Yeah. I agree. They, they both give you the geodesic equation. Um, okay. Um, okay. I'm pleased that it's not obvious. Uh, uh, <laughs> this. Okay. Cool. Um, and actually, this gives slightly more in that it also, um, in, in this way, you need to go at constant rate. Um, which is not true if you extremize it without, with, with the square root. Um, so this, this really gives the geodesic equation, right? This, this is only optimized for a trajectory that goes at constant rate. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and I guess properly, this should also be a detailed or a, a Christoffel symbol tilde. Okay, so since this is a geodesic, um, that means that the proper velocity is always constant, um, which we can write as d tilde mu nu lambda dot mu lambda dot nu is constant um, and equal to the proper velocity squared. Um, which I'm just going to denote like this. Um, and that means that this here we can write as uh, delta s um, is now greater than or equal to, where this means that, that the best I can do is the geodesic, which we've just calculated. Um, zero to t max, dt times v squared. In this integral we can do, right? This is just v squared t max. Now v t max is L tilde, right? This is the geodesic distance. Um, and so this is just L tilde squared over T max. Um, so now we've actually calculated the optimal trajectory, which is a geodesic that you move through at constant velocity. Um, and, and, and we've also calculated the amount of entropy that we produce as we go along this. Um, any questions about this? Um, okay, so while I erase the board, um, I'll, I'll give you some philosophy to think about. So um, we know that the laws of physics are really reversible in time, right? So um, if I show you a microscopic, a movie of a microscopic system, and I show it to you possibly in reverse or possibly forward, you can't look at it and tell me which way, um, which way the movie's being played, right? Um, and of course, the world that we interact with is not. 
Um, so, you know, when you step on the gas, the car moves forward and, and, and all these things. And, and we all know that this is not because of the, the, the slight um, time reversal asymmetry of the microscopic laws, but this is because of entropy. Um, so this is because uh, when you step on the gas, you, you produce a higher entropy state. And so while the microscopic state could flow backwards, there's a lot more ways that the macroscopic state could move forwards than backwards, right? Um, and so I claim that this is missing from all of this, right? Um, so, so in this system, um, it, it's, it's sort of acquiring um, its forward direction, not because entropy is being produced, um, but because lambda of t is deterministic, right? So, so I, I, I've, I, I've, you know, in, in the experiment, I'm shining a laser on this bead, um, and that's what's pushing it forward. Um, but, but in this calculation, we're sort of not worrying about enforcing this lambda of t. It's just happening. Um, and, and, and so what I want to do next is, is come up with a system where I can see all the parts, and everything is just driven by movement of heat from a hot bath to a cold bath, or from entropy production in some way. Um, and, 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 um, and, well, you'll see whether you believe this is a bound, but it's certainly an, ex an example of a system um, for which this second bound is going to hold. Yeah, so we've assumed that lambda of t is deterministic, um, um, but we haven't we haven't calculated how much it costs to make it deterministic, if that makes sense. So we've just assumed that, that it's possible to reach into the system and control it deterministically. Um, but of course, in an experiment, you'd have to pay a lot of energy to do that. Um, and, and the question is, is there a bound for this, or is this just, you know, uh, the easiest way to do it is with the laser, so that's what people do. Um, that, that's, that's the question to think about, yeah. Erase this too. Okay. Um, so um, here, here's the setup that I'm going to have. Uh, So I'm going to have a series of particle baths like this. Uh, um, I'm going to have a system that's connected to one of them. Um, and it's going to move from one particle bath to the next. Um, so this seems a little bit ad hoc, perhaps. Um, and the microstate of the system is just going to be given by Um, where, where now, so, so, so this is the same Boltzmann distribution that we've had before, um, but now what I want you to think about is lambda mu is, is just which of these particle baths I'm connected to, um, and phi mu is going to be the number of particles. Okay. Um, Let's see, what did I want to see? So, so um, and, and, and the reason I want to think about it this way is that in addition to thinking about how much work these different baths um, pay for this system, there's going to be another source of entropy production, which is that if I, don't, if I don't put any input into this system, it's just going to randomly hop back and forth according to detailed balance. Um, but if I pay an energy cost, then I can couple movement in the forward direction to something which produces entropy. Um, so you can think about having another heat bath that's attached to this, and whenever it moves forward, um, it moves a little bit of energy down into a cold bath. 
And if it moves backwards, it needs to move some energy from a cold bath back to a hot bath. Um, and, and, and then we're going to try and optimize all these different things um, and see how much energy it takes to actually move the system um, from lambda naught to lambda f. So we're going to move from lambda naught to lambda f. Um, and there's going to be two sources of entropy production. So one, um, the dynamics of this system are we're going to wait a very long time. So this, this is going to come to equilibrium. And then on a much slower time scale, it's going to randomly hop. Um, and that's going to be a sudden change. So there's going to be sudden changes in lambda. Um, this is going to be one of our sources of entropy production. Um, and then there's going to be an entropic bias. That's going to be the other one. Um, and we're going to make hop the forward direction at some rate r plus, and in the negative direction at some rate r minus. OK, so, so the first thing I want to do is calculate the entropy associated with a sudden change in lambda. And, and we're going to do it in the general case, um, and then we're going to take the limit that, that, uh, that d lambda is small. OK, so what we want to calculate is the expectation value of the work as lambda goes to lambda prime minus the change in free energy. Um, um, and, and, and writing the work first, this is P lambda of x um, times the energy in state x minus the, or sorry, the energy of state x in lambda prime minus the energy of state x in lambda. Um, and then we need to subtract the change in the free energy, and this is just the difference of log z. Um, but remember um, that log of p of x uh, given lambda um, this is just going to be minus e lambda of x minus log z lambda. Um, and so we've actually seen this before, right? This is just the KL divergence between lambda and lambda prime. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. This um, should be. H, I'm sorry, this should be H lambda plus lambda mu phi mu of x. So the, the whole Boltzmann factor. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I'll, I'll keep it as E. But this E should be, should be this whole Boltzmann factor here. Um, and that means that this is just the KL divergence um, between P of x given lambda and P of x given lambda prime, right? Um, and for very short distances, um, we can write this as approximately 1 half GD lambda squared plus more terms. Right, um, and um, just 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 as a reminder, um, g we can write in in two different ways. So one is phi mu phi nu minus phi mu phi nu. Um, and this is maybe making it look familiar with the bounds that we've just been calculating. 
um, that, this, that this term really comes from this, this second cumulant just the way the other one did. Um, but we can also write it as d phi mu d lambda nu. Um, and okay, I want to write this up here. This source of entropy production happens whether we move forwards or backwards, right? One half G. Right, so as I move from here to here, um, I move by d lambda. I'm assuming that g is constant for, for, for the duration of this calculation. Um, and so whether I move forwards or backwards, this is the average amount of entropy that I'm going to produce. And I actually think this is easiest to understand by thinking about um, this, this representation here. Um, so imagine um, some protocol in which I first, from here to here, I come to equilibrium here, and then I move back. Um, so this, this, this is in steady state, but it's not in equilibrium, right? Because when I move from here to here, particles are going to flow in from this bath. Um, and in fact, the number of particles that are going to come in are, are, are equal to g times d lambda, right? Um, and then when I hop back, I'm going to dump those particles into this bath. And so in net, I'm going to have moved g, g d lambda particles from this bath to this bath down their concentration gradient d lambda. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, yes, very much. Yes. Um, yeah. So, uh, right in the in the in the last um, in the last calculation, right, we were really calculating the second moment of the work. Um, and, and that would be the other way to understand this, right? That as I move from here to here, I, I, I do an uncertain amount of work. Um, and that we would understand from this equation, right? OK. Um, that's, that's this first term here, the sudden changes in lambda. Um, but we also have entropy. So, so if I don't pay any entropy, um, I will be in a steady state, right? So, so this, this system will sort of diffuse back and forth um, because R plus needs to be equal to R minus. Um, and it won't move anywhere, but it will always be, be um, producing entropy at this sort of background rate by coupling these baths to each other, right? Um, so I can do better than that if I'm willing to couple movement in the forward direction to um, entropy production. So I want a couple of forward step to some process which produces entropy delta S bias. And you can think about this as, as, as energy, as entropy, um, or, or as free energy, really. Um, but some examples, I could say, you know, maybe I have some autonomous engine on here um, that has a hot bath and a cold bath, and whenever I take a forward step, um, a little bit of heat is transferred from the hot bath to a cold bath. Um, and now when I move backwards, that same heat is going to be transferred from a cold bath to a hot bath, um, but that's less likely um, just because there are more ways for heat to be transferred from a hot bath to a cold bath than vice versa. Um, and what this means is that R minus equals R plus X minus delta S bias. Um, and importantly for the calculation that we're going to do, we're, I, I'm, I'm just going to be assuming um, that N minus the number of hops that I take in, in the backward direction as this protocol goes along is going to be equal to the number of forward paths times um, and and let me just write this 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 here so this is um, 
plus delta S by S. Um, but as I go in the minus direction, I actually get this entropy back, right? This is minus delta S by S. Um, and that's fine, right? There's nothing prohibiting entropy from going down. Um, it just can't go down on average. And, and um, yeah, so this is, this, this can happen, um, but it has to happen less often than the forward direction. There's no integral. This is the equal time correlation. Very much. Yeah, so they're very similar metrics. They, ha they have different units, right? Um, so one is, one has, uh, yeah, one, one has an extra factor of time. Um, so actually, I'll, I'll talk about this in a second, but G tilde mu nu is really like this, but multiplied by a correlation time. Um, where am I here? Okay, so we're ready to calculate the, the total amount of entropy production that we that we're gonna um, uh, that we're gonna have as we as we march through this protocol, um, starting way back here at some lambda naught, and moving forward until we get to lambda f. Um, and I just want to sum these two terms. So we're going to have n plus plus n minus times gd lambda squared by 2. Delta S bias. Is that okay? Um, and just to tell you where I'm going with this, um, I think we should be able to choose um, delta S bias and D lambda to try and optimize this, right? Um, so these are both sort of arbitrary. And in fact, we'd kind of like to take the continuum limit, right? So it's, it's, it's disturbing that, that I'm making these large jumps, these sudden jumps in lambda. Um, but maybe you'd agree that if I made that d lambda small enough, this would be like doing a continuum approximation. OK. Um, so n plus minus n minus. This is just going to be lambda f minus lambda naught divided by d lambda. Is that OK? n plus plus n minus, we can relate to n plus minus n minus um, through this. N plus minus N minus um, over delta S by, uh, sorry, over tanch of delta S bias over 2. Um, so this is exact, um, but now I want to take the limit that delta S bias is small. Um, and it turns out this is the right thing to do, that, that, that if you look at the next correction, um, it pushes you towards this. So this is approximately equal to um, two n plus minus n minus over delta s bias. Uh, this is sort of the end of usable board, right? You guys won't be able to see down here.
Okay, so this is going to be equal to and f minus lambda not over d lambda times g d lambda squared. Um, uh, so, so in other words, you're saying I could make delta s bias large, and then I could make larger steps or something. Yeah. Yes. These are not going to be close. Um, um, I'm sorry, delta S bias is, 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 is the entropy I produce when I move from here to here, just one step, um, and that I get back if I move in this direction. Um, so I want to be able to choose the, the entropic bias of a single step. Well, this is, this is, I'm saying, in the total protocol, um, the number of forward steps minus the number of backward steps is going to be the total distance divided by the step size, right? Um, and, and this we're going to assume is small, or it, we'll assume it's small, and I guess I, 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 I wasn't planning to go into this, but if you let it be larger, um, this also penalizes, so, so, so you do want it to be as small as possible to minimize your entropy production. Is it? Well, um, okay, so I'm assuming that the delta S bias is constant through all of this. Um, and, and this is, so this is, this is for the whole trajectory, and this relates, you know, the, the forward plus backwards to the forward minus backwards of the whole trajectory. Um, but the assumption is delta S bias is yeah, so, so, so this is going to be large, like 1 over d lambda, and, and so is this. That's okay? It's the same delta S bias. That's the assumption, yeah. Yeah, so you could, for example, do better by having um, a, a different delta S bias each time, and then, you know, the, these satisfy detailed balance. It just wants to move this way, but this seems like cheating, because really what you're doing then is just flowing downhill. Um, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know if it's an assumption, but I, I am assuming it's con yeah, I, yeah I, I'm assuming it's constant here. Um, so I, I don't think that's a problematic assumption here. Um, that so I'm assuming it's and, and I'm assuming that G is constant for all of this also. Um, just. Uh, just, just to make the calculation easier, but if you have a changing g, um, then you want to allow for a changing d lambda and a changing delta s, and, and, and it should all carry through. Um, okay, so let me write the next bit of this out, um, which is this plus delta s bias. And, and, and we can start to see something strange going on here, right? That I have one term um, that wants delta S bias to be large, and one term, sorry, that wants it to be small, and there's another term that wants it to be large. Um, and, and, and let's do one more step, which is to define the geodesic distance. Um, and this is just the square root of G times lambda f minus lambda naught. In terms of this, um, delta s total is going to be equal to L lambda naught lambda f times 
get this right. Um, so now I have, I've, I've factored the geodesic distance out, and now the important thing is I have some constant here plus one over the same constant, and so I can't make this small. So this is going to be greater than or equal to two L lambda naught lambda f. So this is what we wanted to show, um, and, and, and this happens when g d lambda squared equals delta s bias. And I think it's useful to think about the two extremes. So one is I can make uh, delta s bias very large. Um, and as I do that, um, this term gets very large, but this term gets very small, and we recover our usual adiabatic limit, right? So the usual adiabatic doesn't consider, um, doesn't consider the cost of moving here. And now I'm going to make d lambda very small. Um, the cost of a single hop goes like d lambda squared, and, 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 and so the cost of the total trajectory um, uh, goes like d lambda, right? I have a d lambda squared divided by d lambda, um, and, and, and that means um, as d lambda gets small, this, this first cost coming from the sudden changes in lambda goes to zero, um, but the delta s bias term gets very large. And, and I would claim that this is sort of the regime you're in um, when you're doing this experiment with a laser and you're doing it very slowly, right? So um, the work that, that, that the bead is actually doing on the DNA, you almost entirely get back as you move forward um, and then move back. Um, but the laser itself is generating a huge amount of entropy. Um, and the other limit, uh, delta S bias, is, is very small, and so this term becomes small, um, but now this system is wasting a lot of energy sort of diffusing back and forth um, and just transferring particles around in their heat baths and down their concentration gradients. Yeah, so here I'm assuming G is independent of lambda. Um, yeah, so you, 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 you can do it in the general case, and, and, um, and I've also assumed that there's just one parameter here, um, but it's just a matter of putting on lambdas, and, 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 and then what you want is that, um, well, you still want this, but you, sorry, you, you still want this, but you want to either space your d lambdas or your delta s bias um, according to g. Uh, no. Uh, this is delta S bias. Uh, no, you're right. Sorry. Yes, like this. Yes, or delta S bias squared. Um, cool. So. Uh, the next thing I want to do is, is just compare these bounds um, and, and talk about them a little bit. Um, so we have. Uh, So the squared over T max uh, and 2L. Make sure I remember the things that I want to say about that. So, okay, the first thing is this, this has this T max here. Um, so this, this you can recover the usual adiabatic limit just by, by letting T max get large. So this has the usual reversible limit, let's say. Um, and this does not. Um, always dissipative. Um, the other thing 
we can understand is, is the scaling of this with system size. Um, and I think one, one way to see that is by another writing of the metric um, as g is d mu d nu f with a minus sign. Um, so the free energy is extensive, right? So if I double the size of my system, or, or to be very precise, if I just take two of the same systems, um, the metric will double, right? Um, but L um, is the integral of the square root of G. Um, and so if you think about this as scaling with N, um, geodesic distances, these all scale like N to the 1 half. Um, and what that means is that this bound scales not with the system size, but with the square root of the system size. Um, this bound scales like root n. Um, this bound has an L tilde squared, and, and um, as, as you were pointing out, um, tilde mu nu, um, this is really the time integral Okay, I'm going to drop the minus. And, and if these correlations decay exponentially, um, then you can write this as times tau system. Um, and, and so this also scales um, with system size, right? In the sense that if I have two systems, um, this metric is going to double. Um, and because this is squared, this bound is extensive. Um, and, and what that means is for, these, for, the, for the large machines that we're used to dealing with um, from engineering, this bound almost surely dominates that bound, right? So um, if I have a car engine with something like 10 to the 23 molecules in it, um, you know, tau system over T max, um, that's probably something of order one to go around a loop. I'm going at 1,000 hertz and the speed of sound in the engine and such. Um, and so this bound is going to be 12 orders of magnitude larger than this one. And this is, is, is totally irrelevant, right? Um, um, but um, I'd, I'd like to think that this bound is probably more relevant for the microscopic molecular motors that you see in biology, which really do operate by uh, burning one ATP molecule at a time and so are closer to this n equals 1 limit, and, and maybe also are really operating in the, in the basically slow regime at the molecular scale. Um, well, so they, they scale differently, right? So, so this one you can make small. So if, if I had a really slow car engine that, that did one rotation every or 10 to the 12 seconds or something, um, then these would get comparable. Um, uh, and for small, for small system sizes, this root n isn't really a problem. Um, and, and these molecular motors, I guess, really do move quite slowly on their time scales of picoseconds. Um, and, and, and so um, I think it's likely that both bounds are irrelevant, but this one certainly is a stronger bound. That makes sense. Um, well, so, so this, is, this, this is the other thing that I think uh, one could argue with. Um, and in particular, uh, this root end scaling is very strange. It means if I have a collection of items, um, it really depends on whether I count each one as being independent or if I count the control as acting on all of them simultaneously, um, right? And so, um, uh, so maybe as a little bit of an aside, what, what happens inside of your muscles um, when, when you contract, is when, when, when you lift something up, is that um, signals from, from higher up um, cause calcium to be released into your cells, and this causes these molecular motors to change their conformation, and now they'll hydrolyze ATP and take a little step. 
Um, and this pulls two polymers together, and, and that's how your muscles contract. Um, and um, I think calcium is, is maybe a good stand-in for this delta S bias. Um, but then there's a question, should you think about calcium as acting on, on the whole cell with lots of different myosin motors in it? Or should you think of an individual myosin motor as being under control like this? And, and you'll get very different answers. Um, and so I... Um, yeah, so, so, so there's, there's lots of interesting questions, like why, why calcium? And that's, uh, so calcium is at very low concentrations normally. Um, it's like six orders of magnitude lower in the cell than outside. Um, so you can send a signal very rapidly. Um, and, um, and you need to pay to pump it back out of the cell, right? So, it's, you know, you, you, you do sort of get all of these costs. Um, but whether, whether cells are actually getting close to this and whether they're controlling all of their motors at once or independently, um, I don't have good answers for these questions. Um, I will say from personal experience, so if you, if you take a molecular motor um, in a lab and you pull hard enough, it will synthesize ATP and walk backwards, um, um, which, well, I don't know if that's something like this, right, that, that, that they're sort of microscopically reversible, but, you know, from experience, lowering a weight is not restful, right? Um, and, and, and you can actually measure... And, and the energy that your muscle expends when you lower a weight is roughly half of what it takes to lift the weight up. Um, so I, m maybe this speaks to, to this bound not being very tight, that there's other things that biology is working up against. Um, or you could maybe argue that that's saying that it's really single molecules, and so this is some bound, something like this is actually uh, uh, similar to the actual energetic cost of lifting the weight up. And I, I don't have a good answer for what I think is, is actually going on. Um, um, there's one other caveat, which I think I'll actually talk about the Carnot engine, and, and that will be a good motivation for. So I'm just going to draw up the usual Carnot engine. Um, so here is volume on this axis and pressure on this axis. Um, and, and the Carnot engine is a cycle, right? So I... Uh, something like this. So this is... Um, here I'm connected to a hot bath. Here I'm connected to a cold bath. Um, here I'm disconnected from heat baths, but moving slowly and adiabatically. Um, and in the usual Carnot engine, um, I'm going to transfer N T hot So I'm, I'm going to transfer some amount of heat from a hot bath into a cold bath. So N is going to be the number of particles in my Carnot engine. Um, P2 and P1 are going to be the pressures at these two endpoints. Um, and I'm going to do some amount of work, which is less than this. Um, so... I'm just going to, yeah, sorry, that was confusing. And, and the reason it's less than this is that um, I need to retrace my steps at some cold temperature, um, and so the pressure is less, but it's, it's still there. Um, and, and usually this is talked about in terms of the Carnot efficiency, right, which is going to be T hot minus T cold over T hot, right? Um, but in terms of entropy production, um, the Carnot engine is, is reversible. So if I do this adiabatically slowly and I ignore the cost of control, um, the entropy production can be brought to zero. And this is sort of a statement that, you know, I can move around this way and then I can retrace my steps and I really get back to the same microstate of the world, right? I haven't produced any entropy. Um, and if you believe uh, this bound, um, 
then I need to pay for the geodesic cost of, or, or for the cost of moving along these, these, these lines. Um, and the distance of this line is going to be log P2 over P1. Uh, this one is more complicated. Sorry. This also gets an important root n. Um, this is going to be root 3n. And now log t hot over t cold. Um, and so if you believe this bound, um, then the total entropy production is actually bounded by 4 root n log p2 over p1 plus 4 root 3n log t hot over t cold. Um, and I guess maybe the important thing to point out is because this, this n gets a square root and these n's do not, if I have an infinite system, I do recover the same Carnot efficiency, but for a finite system, I have a small correction. Um, and still have some time left. This is actually, I got through this faster than I was expecting to. Um, uh, well, so I, I'll, I'll talk about a few, uh, a few caveats. So you, so you were asking whether this maps nicely onto the, the, the cost of controlling things in biology. Um, and, and I think there's another question, which is whether this maps nicely onto, onto an actual engine. And yeah. Yeah, the time to complete the cycle is not present, right? Um, so that, that does show up in this bound, um, but. So my next Exactly. So I'm. It's only when lambda is moved by bias and bias. That's that's true. Yeah, absolutely. And and so I would claim that I would claim that if if um, so it, so this, this bound only applies if it's sort of internally controlled, um, and and I think it should really sum with this one actually. Um, we, we could debate that, but, but that, that, that you still need to pay this one if you do it in finite time. Um, and, and this is really assuming that everything is done very slowly and reversibly, um, and, and that the cost really comes from the cost of control. Um, so maybe uh, we, we talked about this a little bit. Um, a real engine has momentum in its control parameters, um, and um, I, I, I don't know quite how to deal with this properly. My intuition is that this should hurt you, that this is somehow uh, taking you farther from the adiabatic regime. Um, but, but many people's intuition seems to be otherwise, and so I'd like to know how to do this as a proper calculation. Um, uh, and the other thing I'd like to do with this is think of bounds for computation. Um, so um, people talk a lot about the, the fundamental energetic bound of a computation, and I would say the rough um, zeroth order answer is that it doesn't cost anything to do a computation, that computations can be done adiabatically and slowly, um, and, and the only cost is really erasing your answer at the end. Um, um, and uh, I would like to argue that this is, this is sort of, you know, part of the cost that, 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 that deals with the, the information cost of of, or of manipulating the information, but the computation itself, um, if you want to do it physically with a realized computer, um, you're actually physically moving lots of things around thermodynamically, and it should have a cost that's something like this that, that, that comes from the cost of driving the computation forward. Um, and I guess with that, I'll take questions. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. So I, I guess I erased it, but there was this, so there, there were two terms, and I would claim that the, the right, so, so as one got large, the other got small, and I would claim that the laser is in the regime that delta S bias is, is huge, and so it's essentially deterministic. Um, was that your question? Uh, absolutely, yeah. So the, the yeah. So you you could um, I think probably lasers are a bad way to go. Um, you know, you you could imagine a very weak laser with um, with some mirror set up so it traps it, and, and the laser just needs to um, act occasionally to to change. And and I, I don't know whether you could try and come up with a setup that achieves this with lasers, but. Um, um, you could imagine replacing these with, with little masses hanging from strings and, and you change which mass you're connected to. Um, and then I think you could map this problem exactly onto this, if that makes sense. Um, uh, and I guess one of the problems with, 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 with a bound like this is that it's, this is certainly not a proof that you can't do better, right? And, um, and in particular, I think if, if you're willing to give some momentum to your control parameters, um, this is very much not captured here. Mm -hmm. Um. So if there's just heat reservoirs, then I guess I, I would have no problem. But uh, so how? how, how yeah. Mm -hmm. But but I do need a controller to to move the. Hmm. Uh, Okay, I should look at the Stirling engine and see how it, how, how, whether, whether it can be mapped onto this bound. Um, yeah, I, I've not thought about this. Do you think all this goes through with quantum mechanics? Um, or do you mind changing anything? So I, I don't know. Um, I, I would like to know. Um, so the Jarzinski quality does with, with a lot of caveats. Um, so you can basically do the same algebra um, uh, with, um, with a density matrix and you get the Jarzinski quality. Um, and, and it turns out there's a lot of subtleties that this sweeps under the rug that I, I could not explain. Um, um, yeah, my, my intuition is that the, the, the first bound I told you um, that this will basically carry over exactly the same, and I don't know how to think about this bound. Um, yeah, but I, I don't know. This is this this would be quite interesting. Um, I guess I can almost picture how to do the calculation for the first bound, but I can't for the second bound. Um, I don't know. Yeah, so I, I, maybe it would also hold, but I, I wouldn't know where to begin. So the, the, the third cumulant, in this example would come in by letting d lambda be larger. Um, and my, sorry? I think that's probably true that, that, um, that they're no longer going to be geodesics, but I'm actually not sure. I mean, so the third, the third correction will actually look like a Christoffel symbol, which is maybe slightly encouraging for it looking like a geodesic, but I'm not sure. Um, uh, yeah. I guess my intuition is that, that, that if you really look for the optimal, that will still be to space the, the, the lambdas as close together as possible where you can ignore the third cumulant. Um, yeah. So 
um, yeah, so, so I guess here it's just a bound, right? If in, in, in this sort of uh, concocted setup, um, you're allowed to choose this delta S bias, and whether you could design a system that tries to find, that naturally finds it, that I'm not sure. What do you mean? So, there's no sort of, can you build a dynamic loop theory where you have this delta S and sort of, you know, somehow you guys find this? This, yeah, I'm not sure. This, this does sound cool, but you could imagine dynamics that, that try and find the least entropy uh, to do it, but I, I don't know. Is, is, that's what you're saying? You, 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 you try and have dynamics that figure out how to optimize this delta S bias? Yeah, so I, 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 it would be really cool if, if, if biology knows about this and, and has, you know, tweaked the operation of its molecular motors to, to optimize this, but I, I certainly have no evidence for this. So you, you, you could imagine that a prediction of that is that is that muscles and molecular motors are getting close to this. Um, I guess that's that's how I would interpret that in, in this framework. And I, I yeah, um, I, I don't know that there's any evidence for that. I certainly don't know of it. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I cannot. Uh, I would very much like to. Um, so one, one, one thing that's, well, to, to connect many things that I, I, I don't have a good answer for you, I guess, is, is, is this short answer. Yeah, some, something like that. Um, you could also imagine that, that, that um, just this geometric concerns makes it that, that there's particular areas of thermodynamic space that you like to visit um, because, so, so for example, if you're in a negatively curved area, then for um, fixed energetic cost, you can see a very large volume of thermodynamic space. Um, and so this is very appealing to me because it might explain why, why you want to be close to a, a critical point, for example, where there's a large negative curvature. Um, but uh, speculative doesn't even begin to describe that. Uh, 